Good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. It's nice to see all the smiling faces today. And if you notice, you probably aren't even looking at me because of this huge floral display in front of me. But <laughs> I want to give a special thanks to Bob for uh, Bob Kang for giving this for no specific purpose other than to enhance our service and for his, the Lord's blessings. I want to welcome our online audience. I want to thank you for joining us today. We don't want to neglect you. And if we have any visitors that are here for the first time, I want to give you a warm welcome to you. I have not seen any yet other than our visiting speaker, Pastor Gresford Thomas, who comes from us to us from the Northern California Conference. I want to welcome you today. Hope you enjoy your time here. Hope you are warmly welcomed, and we look forward to the message that God has given to you for us today. We have a lot of announcements today, so I'll try to go through them quickly. Um, there will be a deacons meeting today at 1230 after church, and um, we also want to thank those who did come out for the work bee last week, because it does help to keep everything nice and beautiful around here and the things that need to get done. Big announcement today is adventure starts. The Adventure Club will restart from its summer hiatus today at 2 o'clock in the junior room. So, and then they will, after that, it will be the first and the third Sabbath. So if you have adventure kids, come on in. It was a new adventure leader. And I think exciting things are coming for the kids. Um, this coming week, we have a church board meeting. And that will be on Zoom at 7 o'clock on Tuesday. And I think we have a special announcement that Daisy wants to give us. I see her staging over here. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. <clears throat> okay, so you see your flyer. Women's Tea Party is happening. Uh, when? Thank you very much. And for those who do not know how to sign up, on our ontsda.org website. There is a sign-up sheet in the front foyer and also in the back foyer here as well. So please, 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 women who have not signed up yet, please make some arrangements. We have two special guest speakers. Uh, I hope that you all are looking forward to it, to spending some quality time uplifting one another in Christ. And it is optional to bring a hat, but wouldn't it look so beautiful if we all brought hats, that would be wonderful. And it is optional to bring also a teacup so, um, or tea set. So it is optional. But um, I look forward to spending some quality time with you all on that day. September 25th, mark it on your calendar, save it. Time's running out. Please sign up. Thank you. And the last announcement that I wanted to mention is next week, exciting news for me is we are actually going to have our communion Sabbath. We missed it the last time because of um, Pastor Hines' retirement and everything, so we haven't had our communion in this, we missed last quarter. So next week, if you're looking forward, and if you're online and say, I'd like to come for communion, communion will be next Sabbath, so we look forward to that. Please bow your head, heads with me for the invocation. Our Father in heaven, we are just so grateful today for the opportunity to come into your house of worship and your house of praise. We ask that you would guide us, you would bless us, that you would send your spirit to continue to be with us. May everything that happens in this place be for the glory and praise of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I like to mix it up a little, so uh, the song I chose to start off is, um, it's sort of a country gospel type of uh, sound to it, Are You Washed in the Blood? Have 
Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? I like the words to that because we all want to be washed in the blood. <clears throat> the next song is, I, th- I may have told this before, but when I sing this song, it kind of reminds me of the story my dad would always tell uh, about his experience in seminar, in seminary, sorry. Um, when he was in seminary, he had several other um, uh, pastors that were uh, with him, and they would uh, go on various um, I don't know, various visits and trips, and one of their, one of their own uh, students and, and uh, colleagues got sick, and in fact, he was so sick he was dying. He was uh, really crippled, and so they, they all, all the uh, pastoral people went, all the seminary students, they went with the group to visit him, and uh, he was really on his deathbed. He was all crippled up. He couldn't speak. But what they found out is that he could sing. Um, and he could sing the hymns. And despite his, you know, he was curled up, couldn't really speak. But he, despite all that, he could sing all the hymns that they went through. They'd go through the hymnal. And uh, when they got to this one, they sang it. And he was, um, you know, really close to death. And when they got to the, the verse about, uh, the, the third verse where it's talking about, um, you know, being wretched and blind, uh, you know, it, it was a really powerful moment because this man who was so crippled and, and uh, disabled and on his deathbed, he's, he's, he's singing with them that he's, you know, he's been made to see. So um, it, it's just one of those things that when I sing this song, I, I like to pay attention to those words, and, and I think it's nice for us to put ourselves in, in the place of, of that man and think, what has Jesus done for us? Because all of us have, have uh, disabilities of some sort, whether it's uh, the, something that's crippling us from the sin that we have in our lives, something that, uh, uh, you know, is just, just bringing us down, but God is lifting us up. So let's sing Just As I Am. Just as I am without one plea, but 
that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to Let's stand for our opening hymn, Hail Him, the King of Glory. will soon appear. Hail Him, the King of glory, once the Lamb for sinners slain. Tell, tell the wondrous story, Jesus comes to reign. Nations again in strife and commotion, warnings by the morning church happy sabbath it is time now for our tithes and offerings and our our offering today is for our local church budget um, it's obvious what those things go for when you come to church here but i want to read a real simple quote from mrs white 
and it says, in proportion as the love of Christ fills our hearts and controls our lives, covetousness, selfishness, and love of ease will be overcome. And it will be our pleasure to do the will of Christ, whose servants we claim to be. Our happiness will then be proportionate to our unselfish works prompted by the love of Christ. So this isn't just directly at offering this quote, but it is about how we dedicate our lives to service for him. If we support our church, the money in the budget doesn't do anything. It has no blessing until we use it. So in my prayer today, I just want you to think about being part of the church, serving the church, serving our community, and using the funds that you donate wisely and be part of the team that loves Jesus Christ. Let's bow our head. Our Father in heaven, you have been so blessing us, our church, as a congregation. And Father, we know we struggle now waiting for our pastor to come. We ask that you bless us and and inspire us all to be part of your team, not only financially, but part of the crew that uses your benefits to spread the gospel as you've asked us to do. We ask these things in your name. Amen. I'd like to invite the kids up. We take a special offering as they come up called the Lamb's Offering. And this goes to help our tuition assistance for the kids who go to our Christian schools. Who here knows what a democracy is? 
What's a democracy? No one? Politics. Well, it is politics, but a democracy is where you get to vote. So this morning, I'm going to ask you, which story do you want to hear? Do you want to hear a story about a dog? Or do you want to hear a story about me getting hit in the head with a hammer? Uh, who, who wants the dog? <laughs> who wants to hear about me getting hit in the head with a hammer? Really? <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> okay. So, when I was a young boy, probably around five or six, in that age group, I lived in the state of Nevada. Who's, who knows where Nevada is? You know where Nevada is? Where is it? <gasps> no, it's in Nevada. It is right next to California. It shares a big border with California. So you see California on the side, kind of angles. Nevada's right there next to it. So I live there, and one thing that Nevada has is a lot of mines. What's a mine? You've heard of Minecraft? <laughs> What's a mine? Mine is where you dig in the ground, right? Dig in the ground, and they search for silver, they search for gold, but a lot of these mines were abandoned, so they have mine shafts that go in there. And we like to go and explore in the mine shafts. So that's one thing we did. We did that a lot of times on Sabbath. We'd go rock hunting. We'd find all kinds of cool things. We'd find sil rocks packed with silver, with gold, quartz, some beautiful things. But on this trip, I, it was just my dad and me, and we went deep into this mine shaft, one we hadn't been in. So my dad had a flashlight. So we're cruising in, and I'm right next to my dad, as all five-year-olds probably would be. And we get in there, and he sees these beautiful crystals coming up off the top and some neat rock. But he didn't have a headlamp, so he just had the flashlight. So he took the flashlight, and he had to put it in his pocket, and he wanted to get a piece up there. So he told me, okay, go stand right over here. He's shutting the light, and he has me standing a few feet away from him. I thought, okay. But then he needed a chisel and his hammer to hit and get a piece off. So he, where, where was I? Were you listening? Where was I? I was over here. So then what? he took the flashlight. He needed two hands. What do you think he did with the flashlight? Why he did this, I don't know. I probably would have done this differently, but he turned the flashlight off. <laughs> so, flashlight is off, and we're in deep in a mine shaft. What do you think it looked like in there? Pitch black. Pitch black. Who here has ever been in something that is absolutely pitch black, where you can't see your hand in front of your face? So some of you have. So he goes in there, and he's in there, and he's like, so he's up there, holding the chisel, holding the hammer. Who here has ever held the hand up a real long, long time, hitting something? What happens to your arm? Gets tired. So what do you do when your arm's tired? Ah, right. So where was I? No. You listened to the story. You listened to where I was supposed to be, didn't you? But I'm five years old. Where do you think I was when everything got dark? <laughs> it got dark and I went, <laughs> right by my dad. But how dark was it? Couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And my dad's up here hammering. Could he hear me? Could he see me? Was I obedient? Was I where I was supposed to be? No. Lots of no's here. So... It got dark, and I went, and he's hammering. His arm got tired. So what did he do? He 
and he dropped his hand with the big ball peen hammer, hit me right on top of the head, and it went gunk. <laughs> then the flashlight came on. <laughs> and there I am, and I look at him, turns the light on, and what do you think I did? You guys didn't know me when I was a kid. No. I rubbed my head, and I went, Daddy, why did you do that? <laughs> My dad takes me out in the middle of the nowhere in a dark cave and hits me over the head with a hammer. I love you, Dad. <laughs> but it goes to show a couple things. So, some mistakes were made along the way. But when we are told to do something or be in a certain place, like with, even though my dad, as though he were God, he told me to be over here. If God tells you to stay over here, where should you stay? Stay where he tells you. Even if you are afraid and you want to be in this other place where you think you might have safety. But God, in this case, my dad told me, stay over here. Stay out of danger. But instead of listening, I came right up next to my dad, which I thought would be safe, but it was the exact place that wasn't safe. And I got thumped on the head. So if you ever see memory loss or anything, that's why. <laughs> Thank you, Noah. <laughs> so, so, but that is a lesson, is to be obedient to God, even when it doesn't make sense to you. Who'd like to have a prayer? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please be with us, bless us, guide us, and keep us safe, and help us to enjoy this wonderful day that you have created for us, and be with us, and help us to learn from what we hear today, from the sermon and from this children's story. Amen. Who here got a survey and a pastoral recommendation form? Did you turn it in? I, I, I see. We, we do need these quickly, so the, the faster we can get these, the better. Um, we will have our next meeting We'll have one probably next week, but our next meeting with the conference officials will be in October. And we need all the, these forms, especially the recommendation forms. If you have a pastor that you know or you come in contact with or you hear about that you think would be perfect for our congregation, fill out this form. And this needs to be in no later than the 26th of this month. Because, not that we want to cut off you know, any suggestions that come in, every name that comes in, we give to the conference and he has to go through them, check references, check if they're available, and they do a background check on everybody to see if it would be a good fit for here. But that takes time. So we would like to be able to get through those so that by our meeting in, Oct in October, we have some names that we can hopefully narrow down to see who our new pastor is going to be. The other one is a pastoral search committee survey, and I don't want these done during church service, so it makes it a little more difficult because I want you focusing on the service and the um, just worshiping God while we're here. Who here needs these forms? Who here does not have one of these forms? If you do not have one, we will pass them out to you right now. So raise your hand if you need one. We have a couple in the, um, in the transept also. Can someone help Liam, another deacon, junior deacon? We'll need at least two sets in the, um, in the transept. And please, if you want to take a few minutes after church, um, please pass those in. You can give them to me. You can give them to, um, I would say Lita, but she's not here. You could even give them to um, Pastor Honor. Or drop them in the office. But let's try to get these in as quickly as possible. And then we will keep you updated on how things go. 
and may the Lord continue. And the one thing I also wanted to ask, please pray for this process. Um, this isn't something that we're just going through motions. This is, we're looking for the Lord's appointment. And I want to ask the congregation to be an intentional prayer. Add this to your daily prayers, that the pastoral search comes out as God will, not us messing it up. So please continue to pray. Thank you. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Uh, for those who are able, please kneel with me uh, in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you uh, for today, for this day that we're able to worship you on this beautiful Sabbath day. Uh, we want to start by say, uh, praising your name for one of our sisters, uh, Beatrice Guillen, is able to attend today in person. And we, uh, we want to thank you for that, and also her, her daughter, Leslie, who are able to join us today. Um, dear Lord, um, as uh, our brother Sean has mentioned, we are searching for a head pastor, Lord. And we know that you have one in mind that you will send to us. And please, Lord, uh, help us and guide us uh, through this process, and may your will be done. Uh, Lord... Um, as we search for a head pastor, may you embed it in our hearts that we are called here to serve you. We are here to serve each other. Dear Lord, we are not here because we are perfect, but we are here because we know who is perfect, and that is your Son, Jesus Christ. May we continue to grow in Christ as a family, as individuals. And may we be more loving, more patient, more forgiving. Lord, uh, I also want to lift up a few people uh, who are either uh, not feeling well or have lost someone in their family. I uh, want to bring up uh, Preston, who is uh, uh, facing some health issues. also want to bring up Bertha Jones, whose husband uh, suffered a heart attack about a month ago, Lord. I want to pray for uh, the McDermott family who just lost their aunt. Um, Lord, there's so much suffering, and there are names who I may not have men mentioned, Lord, but please, please be with each and every one of them. Um, there are those who are struggling uh, financially with relationships. May you be with them also, Lord. <clears throat> Lord, please be with Pastor Tom, Thomas and please anoint his lips as he breaks the, the bread of life, your message. And may you open up our hearts and minds so that we can absorb that message and apply it and live with it. Dear Lord, again, we just want to thank you for everything you have given us, especially the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading comes from Matthew 25, verses 6 through 10. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins around arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Good morning, Ontario, Sam the Adventist Church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, amen? amen? It's good to worship Him in spirit and in truth, and I'm just happy to have the privilege and opportunity to be here with you today 
to open and break the bread of life. I'd like to thank, and he's not here right now, uh, Pastor An, he and I go back to my time in the seminary. I worked under him, and um, I'm just so thankful to him. In the seminary, uh, things are a little tight, but he, he gave this um, struggling pastor at the time a, a job in ministry uh, at the church where he was pastoring at the time. So when he called and, and asked if I could come out, I, uh, I just I said, sure, sure, I'll, I'm willing to, to come down and to, and to share uh, what the Lord has put on my heart. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Gresford Thomas. I'm the I'm a, di- I'm a district pastor up in the uh, East Bay Area, the Bay Area. I'm about 25, 30 miles outside of San Francisco in the Northern California Conference. Pastor two churches. One of the churches is a uh, bilingual church, Spanish and English. Uh, my wife is joining me today, Elia, and uh, she's very much a part of my ministry, especially with the Spanish group. She's my main translator when I preach there, and I'm just so happy to have her in ministry with me, and there's many other things that she does as well, and I just wanted to uh, give that introduction and say that I'm grateful to have the opportunity to be here today, and may the Lord bless as we move forward and break the bread of life. Let's have a word of prayer before we go any further. Father, I pray that you would open my lips so my mouth may declare your glory. May the words that I speak be seasoned with your love and grace. May we leave here knowing that we have heard your words, not my own. Lord, I'm simply a vessel and a very flawed one at that. So I pray, God, that you would hide me behind the cross and allow everything that is spoken here to be for the glory of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Let the church say amen and amen. You know, for most of my adult life, I've been an individual who likes to take time to plan. I've always been a a planner. And uh, every year, like clockwork, I I purchase a new daily planner, and I I needed to track my appointments. I I needed to uh, mark significant events and and memorable happenings, and I also journal in there as well. It's it's very important to me, especially now as I've um, been working as a district pastor with two churches, I, I find that having a planner is something that I need. And, you know, my wife can attest to the fact that each evening I spend a, a good amount of time going through and planning for the flow of the next day, all the visits that will happen, all of the uh, places I will go, all of the ministry that's going to be happening on that day. Uh, my, my personal mantra, I'm sure you've heard this before, failing to plan is planning to fail. So I make sure that I go through and I plan each and every day. But, you know, what I found over the years is that there's another dimension to planning, preparation, preparation. Now, to some listening, those two words sound like synonyms, planning, preparation, tomato, tomato. It sounds like the same thing. But in my earnest exploration of this topic, it led to a discovery of, uh, that revolutionized the way that I think about planning and the way that I go about my personal planning process. Now, planning, it, it, it provides a structure uh, with a to-do list and, and a context for what we want to happen in an ideal world, right? In an ideal world. But let's face it, how often do things go as planned? Yeah, I see a head shaking. Never. They, they never go as planned. Planning assumes all will go as you think it will go without considering what will happen if it doesn't turn out quite that way, which life often has a way of doing. The problem is that we can create a plan, but things always happen. An accident on our way to work, that unexpected phone call that lasts an hour instead of five minutes, the task that was not so urgent before, but now has become most urgent and needs to get done and gets in the way of other things you need to do. That phone call from the school telling you that, that something has gone wrong or awry with your, with your child. Or even the weather changing. Things happen. We cannot plan for the things outside of our control. We can only anticipate and prepare effectively to handle potential roadblocks or frustrations. Preparation does more 
then prepare you for what to expect. It puts you in a position to handle what you did not see coming. That's what preparation does. To prepare means we are focusing on the things of greatest worth. Preparation looks to the meaning of the plans and, and gives us insight to be agile as we're putting things together and, and ready to move in a different direction when plans fail. To sum up the difference between the two, planning leads to awareness. Preparation leads to readiness. Planning leads to awareness. Preparation leads to readiness. There is a point to this. I'm, I'm getting there. Today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the importance of these two words, planning and preparation, as we wait for the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're waiting patiently. We're waiting expectantly. But what we're going to see that these two words, planning and preparation, they hold a very important place in our wait for the coming of our Lord. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 24 and 25. I hope you brought your Bibles today. That's going to be where we're going to be focusing. And in Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus addresses a present concern of his disciples. The end of this present age. In Matthew 23, he, he laments sorrowfully about being rejected as, as Lord and, and, and Savior by the Jewish leadership. And, and Jesus and his disciples are now exiting that great city of Jerusalem. That's what we see in Matthew 24. Now, as they leave the temple... Jesus' followers, they, they continue to marvel at the matchless beauty of this place. Jesus immediately redirects their attention. He predicts what was inconceivable at that time. The greatest architectural wonder of the Middle East will one day be entirely destroyed. Now this revelation was shocking. And I believe at that moment it left the disciples in a state of wonder and confusion. They were, they were just looking at it and, and, and wondering at it. And, and Jesus kind of uh, burst their bubble and says, one, one day this is all going to fall. But at that moment they held their peace. They didn't say much. I would imagine that they carefully considered the impact and, and the absurdity of the words of their friend and mentor. The Bible tells us at the beginning of Matthew 24 that Jesus and his entourage, they, they, his disciples, they, they continued east across the Kidron Valley and, and climbed the slopes of, of Mount Olive. And, and as they stopped at the top of Mount Olive to rest, their gaze was set upon the temple once again. I had the privilege a few years ago, my wife and I had the privilege of, of uh, being on Mount Olives and, and taking a look out, and we were just amazed at the city, how it stands today. I can't imagine what it looked like when the Temple Mount was there. I can only imagine the beauty of what they saw. It was made of marble and, and gold. Herod's temple was taller than a 15-story building, in a word, impressive, impressive. It was largely constructed of, of, of local white Meleke limestone, limestone that is native to the area there in Jerusalem. And it had a veneer of, of marble and gold on the shrine itself. The rectangular blocks, they were polished specifically to reflect the sunlight. Now, perhaps the disciples saw the temple at, at, at the perfect time as they were on the Mount of Olives, and, and they saw the reflection of the sun on the stone, and, and, and it was the perfect angle. And it, but in any case, what happened at the beginning of Matthew 24 is this breathtaking view caused them to remember what Jesus had said. And they thought, how can this compound, how can God's house, God's place, the place where his presence it abides here. How could this be destroyed? How will that happen? Let's join the disciples and Jesus on the mount as they question him. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And here's what it says. It says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, Jesus is answering, that Jesus is talking to them and they're asking Jesus the question. 
the main question of what they want to know. Matthew 24, verse 3, it says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The disciples' question had two parts. They wanted to know, when will this happen? You said the temple is is going down. When will that happen? And then they wanted to know what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. Now, that second part of the question refers to the Messiah's reign or Jesus' reign in God's kingdom. They were looking, they saw Jesus as the Messiah. When will you reign as Messiah? And the reason they asked these questions together as a compound question is because in the minds of the disciples, whenever that temple goes down, it must be the end. It's got to be the end. So when will it happen? They expected that Jesus Messiah was to inaugurate his kingdom and it would happen at that time. And they wanted to know what is the sign of your arrival? When when, we could be, when can we be sitting on your right and left hand? When can we do away with the Roman rule? Now, in Matthew 24, and this is not a, a sermon about the signs, could be focusing on something else. Jesus spends time I- explaining that what they see as one large event is actually two separate events. The temple will fall, and that's an event that will happen, and I'll give you signs for that, Jesus was telling them. But my coming at the end of the age, that's going to happen at a later time. And I'm going to give you signs for that as well. He goes on to explain these events. As we know in Matthew 24, many of us are familiar with this passage. He talks about it in terms of politics and in terms of the economy, in terms of natural signs and and nature. And then there are religious things that will happen, happen within the church. Jesus gave them a prophetic picture of that time, including the events leading up to it. But he also talked about events in the future, events connected to the last days, the days that we now live in, which is why Matthew 24 is so important to us. Jesus predicted both near and distant events But what he didn't do is he didn't put them in chronological order. The the, the coming destruction of Jerusalem and the temple only foreshadowed the future destruction that would precede Christ's return. Now, in order to understand the prophecy, uh, you need to picture like this. Picture yourself standing on a mountaintop looking at a distant, across a distant mountain range. The mountain peaks, as you're looking across, appear to be right next to one another, but in reality, they could be miles apart, many miles apart. And in between are valleys. Now, Jesus' prophecies pictured these mountain peaks as significant events that would happen, but the valleys represent the time that would pass in between. Maybe a year, maybe thousands of years. We're still waiting for things to happen that are there in Matthew 24. The destruction of the temple was in AD 70, and we're still waiting for things to happen. But the truth of Jesus' prediction regarding Jerusalem assured the disciples and assures us today that everything else he predicted will also happen temple fell, we know that everything else will happen. These signs give us the assurance that Jesus will come soon. The signs give us the tools we need to plan for the return of our Savior. At the beginning of this message, I made a statement and I made sure to repeat it. There's a difference between planning and preparation. Planning leads to awareness. Preparation leads to readiness. The signs of the times make us aware that Jesus is coming soon. We don't have the exact years. We don't have the dates. We don't have the times. But as we review them, our awareness level is raised. As we see the things happening in our midst, as we see COVID-19 and all the things happening, our awareness level should be raised to the fact that Jesus is coming soon and assuredly. 
We become aware of the state of the world. And, and what we do is we understand that we need to turn our attention away from the world and towards Jesus. We become aware of the urgency to spread the good news of, of his love to a world desperately, desperately seeking for belonging and for the peace that only he can give. Here's how the Bible explains what it means to be aware. Matthew chapter 24, we're going to skip through to verse 42. As I said, this is not about the signs. I'm not going to be going through them one by one. But I want to go to verse 42 because it says something very, very important for us to know and understand in Matthew 24, 42. Here's what Jesus said after he had talked about all of the signs. He says, turns to his disciples, and he says, Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Watch. The word in the original, original language is Gregorio, and it means to be watchful. It means to be fully awake. Fully awake. It means to be in continuous readiness. It means to give strict attention to, to be cautious, to take heed or care so that no destructive calamity suddenly overtakes you. In this verse, Jesus tells his disciple, watch. Live in such a way that whenever he comes, they will be prepared. And this tense of watch, it's a present tense, and it's a continual tense, and it means keep watching. It doesn't just mean watch, read your Bible one time and take a look and say, oh, that's nice, I'll, I'll, I'll pay attention next time. It means to, to continually uh, go through and, and see how things are progressing. Keep watching because things are, are happening that are leading up to the second coming. Raise your awareness. Raise your desire to see Jesus. The purpose of the signs is to help us plan for eternity. The signs help us plan for eternity. When we're attempted to align ourselves to the ways of the world, our awareness of the hope of eternity is ignited as we see the signs of the end manifest themselves. The signs are meant to help us prepare for eternity. This is the message of Matthew 24, to help us to prepare, to, to plan, to prepare. Unfortunately, sometimes we stop at Matthew 24 and remain satisfied with this planning that we can plan and, and see what's happening. Okay, we, we know what's going on at the end, but we leave out the action of preparation. This is where Matthew 25 comes in. Matthew 25, let's look at our scripture reading. This is where we're going to be focusing today. Matthew 25, I'm going to read verses 1 through 13. It's a long text, so please follow along. But I'd like to read the entire parable. And then I'd like to touch on some of the, the aspects of the parable that talk about preparation and the importance of preparation and what Jesus was trying to point out to his disciples. Because Matthew 25 is just a continuation of Matthew uh, 24. It's not a, a, a new thought. It's, it's just a continuation. Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Please follow along. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourself. And while they went out to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. 
So much to unpack in Matthew 25, 1 to 13, but I want to focus on one word, and that word is preparation. Preparation. Planning leads to awareness. Preparation leads to readiness. This parable is all about being prepared or ready for the second coming. Matthew 24 is about planning or being aware of all the things that are happening. But this chapter is about being prepared and having, being in a state of readiness. The title of the message today is Trimming Your Lamp. Trimming Your Lamp. Matthew 25 begins by equating what he's about to say in a familiar yet powerful manner. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to. Now, if we read through Matthew, we see this phrasing throughout the book. But in this, uh, in this chapter here, we're seeing it the, for the final time. And this instance is different because this instance is comparing the kingdom of heaven to something, uh, something else different than it is in previous chapters. And here in Matthew 25, it's in the future tense, while in every other instance, it's in the present tense. So when Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven as like a mustard seed, he's talking about the present tense. But when he's talking here about this story of the, about the uh, virgins, what he's doing is he's looking at the future tense. He's looking at the arrival of the kingdom at his second coming, the end of the age. This parable is for us. The kingdom is not like the young maidens or the virgins, but rather what the statement is saying is the situation at the second coming will be like the story that we're reading about the wise and foolish women. So let's take a look at the similarities. They were all young women. They were all invited to the wedding. They all had lamps. They all had oil. They all had oil to begin with. They all slept when the bridegroom was delayed, they all trimmed their lamps. For almost all intents and purposes, these young ladies were identical. Each one was invited to the wedding and made plans to, to uh, ensure that they arrived early before the bridegroom came. They were anticipating the bridegroom coming. Before anything else, the Bible tells us that they were going out to meet the bridegroom. But then we're thrown a curveball almost immediately when we're told that, well, well, five of them are foolish and five of them are wise. Oh, what does that mean? And we're told in the next verse that, that what made them foolish was one seemingly insignificant item. Just a little extra oil. Just a little oil. To go with that oil, though, to go with that oil supply for what they were doing is a piece of pure thoughtlessness. Not simply a, a failure to plan for any contingency. They had it all planned. They were going to meet the bridegroom. They were going to enter into the wedding. They were going to enjoy the festivities. But what do we say about planning? There's always something that happens to change the plans. There's always something that happens to, to throw you off. And what happened in this particular parable was what? The delay. That's right. The delay. And this is where we see the difference between planning and preparation. Planning leads to awareness. Preparation leads to readiness. They all slept, but when the midnight hour came and it was time to enter in, only five were prepared or ready to enter. They all had planned well, but only five were prepared. You know, friends, as Christians, we need to understand that when God works on our behalf, he works in the realm of preparation. He makes plans, yes, but we see many instances where he's focused on preparing us to be in relationship with him. John the Baptist, what did he do? He prepared the way of the Lord prepared the way of Jesus. Everything that he did and said made sure things were set in motion for the Lamb of God who takes the sins of the world to come on the stage. 
Psalm 23, we're familiar with Psalm 23, verse 5. He prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. When we face situations or, or concerns beyond our control and understanding, God is prepared and ready to meet us and help us. Our God is a God of preparation. And what we need to understand is preparation is a key part of being a part of God's kingdom. This parable underlines the need to be prepared. In verse 6, it tells us, let's look at verse 6. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. The bridegroom showed up, and their response was to trim their lamps. Trim their lamps. Now, what does that mean? The process of trimming their lamps was one that involved both planning and preparation. It involved both. A lamp is trimmed when the wick is turned either up or down to regulate the amount of flame. But if the lamp is empty, doesn't have any oil, it doesn't matter how much you trim. The lamp's going to go out. It's not going to have a light. The oil will be consumed. So the regulation of the wick is the planning to display a bright enough light. But even though you plan... If you don't have the oil, if you're not prepared, the lamp won't light. The foolish virgins tried to make last-minute preparations by going out and getting their oil, finding a place where they can buy it. And, you know, the, the oil that they got, there's, there's nothing wrong with, with that oil. The problem is when they got back, the door was shut. The time to enter had run out. You see, friends, preparation is also about timing. We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, here's what it says. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The time for salvation is according to God's timing, not our own. Preparation is also about timing. You know, at Seventh-day Adventists, we should be, we should be, know a lot about this because when we rest on the seventh day, we do it in accordance to the rhythm of creation. It was a set-aside time. I've, I've read many uh, books and, and, and uh, I've seen many things about having a Sabbath, having a time that you set apart. But there's an acceptable time for things. And, and the seventh day is the time for us to take, uh, take a step back and to rest and know that God is our God and our Redeemer. And also, we prepare the world for the time that Jesus will come. This is what the Advent part of our name is about. We're looking forward to the second coming of Jesus, and we're preparing ourselves and preparing our world to meet our Lord and our Savior while teaching them to live the best life that they can in the here and now. I want to close today by answering a simple question that I always ask when I, when I write a sermon. I, I sometimes put together a sermon. I, I say to myself, so what? So what, what relevance does this have to the people you're going to be presenting to? Lord, what relevance does this have to me? So what does it mean to have enough oil? What does it mean to be prepared for the coming of the bridegroom? Let's go back to Matthew 25. If you're in Matthew 25, I want to look at verses 11 to 13. We're closing now, and we're going to take a look at what it says here. It says in Matthew 25, 11 through 13, afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. The last words in verse 12, jumped out at me. I do not know you. It's a short and final phrase from the bridegroom. Preparation for the wedding feast 
is about knowing Jesus. In order to be prepared, when the bridegroom opens that door, he said, looks at us and says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I know you because you know my son. Because you have spent time with him. You've allowed him to become part of your life. You've allowed him to become the hope of your glory. And because I know you and you know me, enter in. Friends, we can plan and plot the signs of his coming. We can look at certain things and, 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 and kind of read, the, read what's happening in our world. And we could plan that and, and know things. But friends, what we need to understand is that in order to be prepared, in order to be prepared, we need to take time to get to know him. When Jesus comes, it won't be about false doctrine. It won't be about error. The main emphasis will be about our relationship with him. Let me clarify the statement because I'm not saying that doctrine and error is not important. What I'm saying is knowing Jesus means we are coming along and growing in knowledge of proper doctrine and truth. But it's also true that we can have a knowledge of proper doctrine and truth and still not know Jesus. In the parable, those with the oil possessed the character of Jesus. The bridegroom can look at the five wise virgins and say with loving confidence, you I know, I know all of you, enter in. Indeed, the oil is the Holy Spirit, the filling of God's presence in his people. But the oil also represents that 20 to 30 minutes you spend reading your Bible each morning. The oil is replenished when we seek time to converse with God through prayer. The oil comes to full and overflowing when we take time to fellowship with our brothers and sisters and, and share how God is intersected with our lives. It's all about Christ being in you, Christ being in me. This is the hope of glory according to Colossians Chapter 1, verse 27. Friends, there's so much to say about this parable and, and the rest of Matthew 25 and preparation, but I'd like to close by reading a sentence from one of my favorite books, Christ's Object Lessons. But perhaps you heard of the author, Ellen White. Here's what she says. We cannot keep Christ apart from our lives here and yet be fitted for his companionship in heaven. We cannot keep Christ apart from our lives here and yet be fitted for his companionship in heaven. May we all be fit for the kingdom by trimming our lamps and filling it with the oil of Christ's presence in our hearts. May God bless you. Please stand for the closing hymn, 604. We know not the hour. We know not the hour of the Master's appearing. Yet signs all are know of the moment is nearing. When he shall return, tis a promise most cheering. But we know not the hour he will come. Let us watch and
but we know not the hour. He will come. Let us watch and be ready. He will come. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He will come in the clouds of his Father's bright glory. But we know that you will come. Lord, I pray that as we have explored Matthew 24 and, and 25, that, that we would be a people who is planning for your coming, watching the signs, but that we will also be a people who, who are preparing our hearts to receive your presence, to receive your spirit on a daily basis. Because, Lord, we want to see your face. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I just would ask that you would guide us, you would bless us, you would fill us, you would dismiss us with a blessing. May we leave this place knowing that we have heard your word and not my own, and may we leave this place ready to share the love of Jesus in whose name we pray. Let the people of God say, Amen.